Boxing Champions presents our official weigh-in for tomorrow's exciting night. I believe uh, they are starting action. the weigh-ins. If we want to go to them TGP now, uh, why don't we do that? We'll go to the Benavides and Gula weigh-ins live from the Mohegan Showtime. Sun in Uncasville, Connecticut. Let's we will get going with our first weigh-in. It will be eight rounds in the super middleweight division. First up to the stage out of the red corner, fighting out of Accra, Ghana, with 27 victories, including 18 by knockout, opposite of one defeat and one draw. Presenting Habib Wild Hurricane Ahmed. One sixty six point four, one sixty six point four for Ahmed. And now his opponent out of the blue corner with a record of 26 victories, 12 coming by way of KO, opposite of just two defeats. Fighting out of Forestville, Maryland, presenting Alantes Sly Azo Fox. One sixty nine point six, one sixty nine point six for Fox. This bout will be eight rounds in the super middleweight division. Once again, Habib Wild Hurricane Ahmed taking on Alantes. Sly Aza Fox. Brian, let's sort of get to this if we can while the weigh-ins are happening. As you can see here, the fighters are being asked to have face-offs with uh, six feet of distance, I suppose, per CDC protocol. We were talking very quickly, if we can, while we wait for the rest of the fights to weigh in about the co-main event between Otto Wallin and Travis Kaufman. As you can see here, by the way, very quickly, there's the sanitization process that has to go down between the, the fights. Uh, Brian, if you can, very quickly, um, your thoughts on Wallin and Kaufman. Look, it's an opportunity for Otto Valin to, to really let us know who he is, Luke. And that close-up we got against him when he fought Tyson Fury last year for the heavyweight championship was as close as you can come to pulling the upset, opening that big cut against Fury, and really announcing himself. Was that one great night at the office? Or is this six foot five and a half heavy, heavyweight from Sweden legitimately a top 10 and eventual maybe top five contender? He's going to have that opportunity against a rugged veteran in Travis Kaufman, who at the very least is going to be there for rounds. He is a tough out. He can box. He can do some things. But for Valin, he's got so much bright potential. And I think if there's one great thing he showed against Tyson Fury, maybe a little bit of a mean streak, which is such a coincidence, Luke. I don't know if you've ever talked to him, but out of Aline, maybe the nicest, most polite boxer in this game. Yet you saw him in the ring. I asked him straight up when Tyson Fury's cut opened up. Did you dip the glove in there? Did you try to make it worse? Did you try to do whatever it took to win a championship? He said, I'm not proud of it, but I had to show him that I wasn't afraid. That at the very least is the intangibles of what makes a title contender. Uh, the next fight to weigh in will be the opener of the Showtime telecast. Rolando Romero taking on Jackson Marinez. As we talked about it before, a weird situation kind of with the WBA lightweight, right? Let's see if I got this right. They've got a super champ. They've got the world champ. They've got the gold champ. And this will be for the interim champ at lightweight. A lot to unpack there, but first, just the fight. Romero, a guy out of Mayweather's camp, looks like he is the real deal Holyfield, so to speak, taking on Jackson Marinas. What do you make of this matchup? Well, look, whether or not Roly Romero actually is the real deal, the best part about him is he believes he is, without a doubt. We know he's uh, a fighter that was handpicked and promoted by Floyd Mayweather, unbeaten at 11-0. He's facing a very interesting out in Marinas, who's unbeaten himself, but is much more of a slick boxer to Romero as the puncher. And Romero had said so many big things this week. The hot spot, the machismo was out. He thinks all the big names at 135, Luke, are avoiding him. 
And he also made this prediction, and I want to get the quote right, that his knockout of Marina's this weekend will be very brutal and one of the worst the sport has ever seen. Hmm. Um, I'll have what he's having in terms of believing in your power. He's going to have an opportunity Saturday night to show us that. A little bit more than that, Romero's an interesting fighter, right? Because he is all action, all fence, all the time. To the point where, yes, he'll get stoppages, but it allows opponents... Oh, here we go. Let's go to the scales here. These are the weigh-ins for, I believe, the... Actually, I think they're having the weigh-ins for the uh, Valin and Kaufman fight. Let's go to the weigh-in. Let's see the, hear the stream here, please. This bout will be opening up the broadcast tomorrow live on Showtime at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Pacific. Ten rounds in the heavyweight division. Travis, my time. Kaufman taking on Otto. All in, Volen. So a bit of a correction. Let me make clear on this. The Romero and Marinas fight, that will be your co-main event. The opener will be the only non-title fight on the card between Valin and Kaufman there. You saw something interesting there. Valin, he's tall. He's lanky. He actually has some real uh, leverage, so to speak, on Kaufman. What do you make of Kaufman? We talked about Valin. What is Kaufman up against in terms of what he can bring? We know like Valin, a, a bit more of a known commodity, and certainly Kaufman to that extent too, actually older than Valin, but he has an opportunity here in terms of matchups, three southpaws in his last four fights. What, what can he bring to the table? Well, look, what Valin does best and his, what he's best known for is his footwork and his hand speed. Yeah, he showed a little bit more of the ruggedness and the power, but that's the biggest challenge facing Kaufman. Does he have the speed to be able to keep up with a, let's say, younger, fresher fighter and out of Valin who maybe has a brighter uh, long-term picture in this division? We've seen Kaufman step up against the very West. He went rounds against Luis Ortiz, and I mentioned he is tough. But one thing Travis Kaufman will have going for him is inspiration, Luke. We've all in the boxing game have been touched by the loss of legendary trainer brother Nassim Richardson. Richardson has served as lead trainer, co-trainer, or just Philly mentor to Travis Kaufman for years. This obviously caught him off guard. He's dedicating this fight. He's going to have his father, Marshall, in his corner. They've been longtime friends with Nazim Richardson. That could play a factor in terms of his motivation, but he's really going to have to be able to keep up with Valine and hurt him early to try to discipline him and try to make this more of a fight on his terms. That's why you see Otto Valine as the favorite because of those skills. And just to give everyone the clarification here, because I did not hear the numbers, but we will share them just the same. Otto Valin weighing in at 241.3 uh, fourths, or I should say 241 and uh, three quarter pound, and then Same Kaufman, 234 and a quarter pound. I got to tell you, BC, I'm a, I'm a little bit more of a fan personally of the old school scales rather than the new digital ones because it allows you to fudge it just a little bit, which means there's fewer fights canceled on balance over time. But as you can see there, Valin, the bigger guy, the taller guy, I believe he has a greater reach as well. It's going to be an interesting contest. Now, this takes us to our co-main event, the vacant WBA interim lightweight title. Let's go to the feed. 135 on the dot. 135 for Marinez. And now his opponent, his record unblemished. 11 victories, including 10 coming by way of knockout. Fighting out of Las Vegas, Nevada, the number 10 ranked WBA lightweight, the hard hitting Rolando Roli Romero. 134.8 for Romero. 134.8. So we have 135 for Marinez, and we have 134.84 for Rolando Romero. No face-off? Uh, how about that for social distancing? I'd like to see a little. Here we go. Here we go. Luke. There we go. This will be our no shortage of confidence, as we mentioned in Romero, but Marinez has said all the right things this week in terms of how he thinks he's going to match up against him. And also, if there is one advantage, you would agree with this. It's not really actually; it's quite indisputable. Marinez has uh, experience going longer in fights. He has had uh, the opportunity to really sort of push it 
past the normal parameters that um, uh, uh, Romero typically finds himself in. Yeah, well, Romero knows the uh, the stigma against a guy like him with only 11 fights. You haven't gone the 12-round distance. You haven't been tested in the deep waters. I like what he said. I don't train to try to go there. I try to knock you out. But he did mention going 15 rounds and sparring. He's confident uh, in his ability, in his intangibles, should it get there. But that's really Marina's opportunity to use those boxing skills. Use Robert Garcia in his corner. Luke, uh, Marina's of Dominican... Uh, uh, background. He said he loved the Mexican style he's learning in the past year from Robert Garcia, obviously one of the best trainers in the game today, maybe to improve that offensive outburst, but slickness is his calling card, and you're going to have that real old school sort of classic matchup of boxer versus puncher, bull versus matador. You just better believe that Roley Romero, that bull, he's coming to end this fight early. And I want to be clear about some of the numbers here. Both guys in their 20s, Romero the younger of the two, 24 to 29, the key here is they both are undefeated, which I really like. The thing that stands out is the KO percentage, 90.9%, 90.9% for Romero, 368 for Marinez. And you might say to yourself, 368 that's not very good. It should be sort of known, sometimes you can come from a nation where the boxing game is not as developed, and a lot of times you will get fighters that are not as credentialed and ends up padding your record. That is not the case with Marinas coming from the Dominican Republic. He has fought really tough guys with winning percentages all the way through, which maybe he isn't quite the power puncher and the offensive dynamo that Romero is, but that 36.8 BC, it shouldn't fool you into thinking, well, this is just a guy that has to ride it out the whole time. He's been fighting pretty tough guys in ways that a lot of times someone from his background may not necessarily face them in that same way. You know, that's where his advantage and experience uh, could play a factor. And, you know, one thing he said is Romero's overconfidence is going to play against him just as much of his experience will. And look, when you're a puncher, sometimes you have to grow to become one. Sometimes you grow into your man strength. Sometimes you, you learn that over time. We know Romero, a natural puncher. Marina is more of a boxer at his core. All right, so here we are going to have the weigh in now for the main event David Benavidez taking on Alexis Angulo of Colombia let's see how this goes let's go to the feed here if we can this is Angulo who's wearing gloves by the way One sixty-seven point six for the challenger Angulo. One sixty-seven point six. You heard there for Alexis the Angulo, stage. the challenger. His record undefeated. Twenty-two victories, including nineteen coming by way of knockout. Fighting out of Phoenix, Arizona, presenting the reigning and defending WBC super middleweight champion David El Bandera Rojo Benavides. One seventy point eight for Benavides. One seventy point eight. Wow! Wow! Uh, wait a second here, BC. Uh, okay, just to recap, this is your main event. Angulo coming in one sixty seven point six. Here is the face-off between Ladies them. And gentlemen, this the limit is, is 168. Benavidez coming in at 170.8 with no one-pound allowance. So let me see if I can... This is this is new to us. So let me see if I can uh, make sense of this. This means, if, if I'm understanding this correctly, BC, Benavidez has missed weight. I think he just lost the title on the scales. Yeah, typically you're allotted uh, you know, a time, whether it be an hour, depending on the state commission, to get that second chance. He may have that opportunity. He may decline that, depending on where his body is. But he will not have a chance to fight for that title that he's holding, the green belt, the WBC, if he doesn't get under that 168-pound limit. Right. So I guess we'll see what the situation is. We'll clarify with that if he's going to additionally cut weight. At a bare minimum, Angulo should – I'm trying to remember the rules here. Angulo should be qualified – to fight for this belt no matter what happens with Benavidez, whether or not he qualifies. So he at least will have the opportunity. I guess it remains to be seen. Wow, what do you make of this? I, 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 don't, I don't recall Benavidez missing weight previously. He's had some other indiscretions outside of the ring, which ones he was able to come back from, but I don't recall weight being an issue. What do you, I mean, we'll have to talk to him to get more of this, but what do you attribute that to? 
I mean, look, he's a young fighter who's, you know, growing into himself. Let's not forget, he also used to fight as high as 250 pounds as a teenager, uh, becoming an amateur boxer at age 13, turning pro at age 16, as we mentioned. But uh, it's unprecedented times right now, and I don't say that as a potential excuse. I just say that as a reality, whether we're covering mixed martial arts or boxing, you don't know how people are going to react to these adjusted training camps, to just taking the normal and making it the abnormal in terms of your nutrition, your time with your trainers and all that we've seen in UFC fighters actually training over Zoom. We've seen a lot of different things. We know Benavidez, born and raised in Phoenix, recently moved to Seattle. A, a lot of changes in certainly his life. This is a long layoff for him, and he's going to have that chance to get under that limit, but that's a tough blow off the first time on the scale, two pounds over. Still, and you never really know when these guys talk to the media. It's like, how honest are they truly being? But it is worth noting, Benavidez this week saying he had moved to Seattle and everything was good. He was able to focus. He had a private training scenario that he was able to bring in sparring partners and be very careful about it. In other words, that, yes, the pandemic might have interrupted the normal flow of things, but it did not really interrupt his ability to get ready for this contest. That is interesting. Now, we are set to be joined it should be noted, we are set to be joined by Benavidez, which if that is the case, BC, I don't know if he's going to use the extra hour or not to make the weight. But by the way, if you're off by, let's see, the, the limit being 168, so 169, 70, 171, two and a half pounds, that sometimes can be doable, especially the heavier you get to get that off in an hour if it's possible. But also, that could drain you, and it's better to take the W than the L, even if the title is on the line. Yeah, he could still win this fight on Saturday night not and lose his title right here if he doesn't get under the limit. And look, it's a, it's a tough setback for a fighter who worked so hard to come back from originally being stripped of his WBC title for recreational drug use. He said all the right things afterwards, did all the right things physically and professionally, and as we mentioned, looked great last year against Andre Durrell in that pay-per-view, I'm sorry, Anthony Durrell in that pay-per-view co-main event to win back his title to lose it a second time would be a tough blow. We'll see what happens in this. And the, it, it's a fluid situation, to say the very least, Luke. Does this, does this, in your mind, change the calculation for how much Angulo has a chance? Certainly, because uh, we've seen it go, obviously, both ways when it comes to, let's say, what we're projecting here. We're not sure what's going to happen in the next few minutes. But should... Uh, ultimately should Benavidez not make the weight sometimes that can be an advantage when you're not forcing yourself in that last few you know in that final hour to cut down and to really go into a dark place where your body can just go no more other times it can be a disadvantage I'd have to think overall it's probably more of an advantage but you're always going to see that play out in different ways you know if this is an interesting moment in the 23 uh, year old life of Benavidez, right? Because if you test positive for some kind of a drug, to me, I don't really think there's any discussion about it if it is recreational and it happens in a window outside of direct competition, which is basically what had happened to him. He still was punished for it, which to me, you start turning into vice cops with athletic commissions. Let's put a pin in that conversation. We'll come back. And we are joined now by Mr. Benavidez. He is there at the weigh-ins, ready to speak to us. Uh, hi, David. How are you? Um, you know, man, I'm, you know, very disappointed, of, you know, I've, uh, obviously it's my first time missing weight, you know, um, you know, I'm just, uh, you know, like I said, very disappointed, you know, losing the title on the scale, you know, but I still got a job to do tomorrow, you know, I'd lose the title, but I'm still going to win the fight tomorrow. Yeah, just to clarify, I do believe this means you lost the title from the scale. Can you tell us from your vantage point, what exactly happened that caused you to miss weight? You know, maybe, you know, I, I put the blame on myself, you know, there's nothing that could have, you know, I just the last three pounds wouldn't come off. Maybe, you know, um, not having the proper things I need, you know, maybe sauna. I was only able to go to the gym, you know, for an hour a day here, you know, since I've got here. Um, you know, it's just a couple of different things. But, you know, obviously I'm very disappointed in, you know, stuff that's happening right now. But I still got a good job to do tomorrow. You know, um, I'm definitely get another opportunity, you know, later in the future. But tomorrow I still got I still got to fight to win. David, obviously this is a tough setback to face and something you certainly didn't plan. Uh, how do you think that will affect your mindset when you go in the ring? You're fighting to keep your unbeaten record. You're not fighting to win back that title that you worked so hard in the past year plus to get. Do you expect any sort of uh, extra motivation or maybe a, a, a personal challenge in that? Definitely. You know, I'm definitely, you know, no, a hundred times angrier. You know, I'm coming into this fight, you know, um, I don't even I don't have my belt no more, you know what I mean? So the only thing I could get out of this fight is winning. You know what I mean? That's that's the that's the ultimate motivation right now. 
um, I'm still looking to come in strong, you know, and uh, uh, put up a good fight. Like I said, I was going to put up a good fight for all the fans, and that, that's what I'm looking to do. Did you give any consideration to uh, to making a second effort to cut off the extra weight, or was it too much was, for your body? I was trying all this all morning last night. I, I just got to those three pounds where it just, you know, I, I worked out for an hour, literally, and nothing came off. You know, it was dry as a bone. Um, you know, and I just had to think about, you know, um, you know, there's nothing else I could do. You know, if you, you move around for an hour, I had sauna suits working out. Um, maybe if I would have had a big bathtub, just laid in the bathtub for an hour, but I wasn't able to access that either. Uh, no sauna, you know what I mean? And then just when the body, you know, feels like I couldn't, I couldn't sweat anymore, you know what I mean? So there's, there's just nothing I could do there. Uh, David, as long as fights are taking place in the pandemic, does this experience change the way you might prep your weight going forward? Definitely. De I didn't. I didn't really. I didn't think this all the way through. You know what I mean? Coming in, you know, I didn't. I thought I was gonna have access to more. You know, but unfortunately, I didn't. Um, you know, it's just maybe a message to all the other fighters. You know, have trouble a little bit, trouble with their weights. You know, it's um, if I, you know, it's, it's gonna be hard making a weight if you already have trouble making weight. You know, um, we're only access allowed access to the gym one time a day. You know what I mean? Um, no saunas, no none, nothing like that. You know what I mean? So if, if you need a couple extra things, you know what I mean? It's um, you should probably make the weight before you get to the to the to the to the wherever you're going, where the bubble, wherever it is. You know what I mean? It's because it's, it's very hard. Obviously, David. David I talk was, sorry, BC. One more, if I can. Uh, obviously, David, you want you don't want to look past your opponent and Gulo on Saturday, but losing the title this way. To what extent does that change some of your plans for 2020? Yeah, it changes all of them. Yeah, it absolutely changes all of them. So, you know, um, for 2020, the only thing I got to look forward to is this fight. You know what I mean? I still, you know, I, the way this uh, outcome of this fight, you know, my, I might still be able to get a fight by the end of the year. But, you know, this is uh, this is probably the biggest fight I have until the end of the year. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm definitely looking to do my best, you know, and have a great performance still. David, you have an opportunity to stand across from Alexis Angulo today. Opportunity to 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 see him around the bubble, so to speak. Uh, what'd you take from those looking into his eyes? It's the same thing. It's a fight. You know what I mean. Uh, he wants to win the fight. You know what I mean. He has the opportunity to win the belt. You know, but I'm just looking at him. You know, it's, it's you know it's going to be a very brutal fight tomorrow. You know, just I mean, I already lost the belt. So the only the thing I can get out this fight, you know, is getting a good KO or again giving an amazing fight. You know what I mean. So that's what I'm looking forward to tomorrow. There's an interesting element, David, of this matchup where the things that you do well also play into what he does. He sits back. He's a heavy counterpuncher. He can throw hands. Is there any sort of uh, fear would be the wrong word, but pause in making this an all-action brawl, knowing that he does have some legitimate firepower? You know, we still, we're still going to follow the game plan. You know what I mean? Just because I have extra motivation to win the fight, or you know what I mean? It doesn't mean I'm just going to go in there reckless. I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to go in there reckless. You know, I still got to be patient. At the end of the day, this is a fight. You know what I mean? You know, he has he has good punching power, but I do as well. You know what I mean? Um, we're still going to stay patient. The, the game plan follows, you know, as, as if everything, you know, is good. You know what I mean? So we're st stick to the game plan. Um, but, you know, we're definitely going to make a we're definitely going to make this into a, into a great fight. David, we know you got to run. So we appreciate your time. Appreciate your candor. Looking forward to seeing you compete tomorrow night. Thank you. Thank you, guys.